Dr. Farmer. Hello, Lilu. How are you doing today? Uh, doing well, doing well. Just had a great breakfast and... Uh, Ready to go for the day. The weather is overcast here in Southern California, or at least in the beach area, Laguna Beach, California. So uh, we kind of missed the summer, you know, but you here see, we go I th on I th the fall. I thought today you would be wearing your hat because I saw some amazing, beautiful pictures of you wearing all those great hats and being in nature. Oh, that's kind of you. Yeah, I've got nature outside my door. And my hats, unfortunately, they're, they're tucked away somewhere. I, I didn't think to wear my hat today. So, uh, I do off and on. I showed up one time at a workshop and I wasn't wearing my hat. And two or three people said, what happened to your hat? <laughs> I've become uh, probably a little too identified with the hat. So we'll see. <laughs> well, you're, you're an author, a teacher, and a soul healer. So today we're going to talk about the soul healing and, and, and tell us about that and why we, do we need to heal our soul? Uh, it's a good question. The um, soul healer really encompasses a lot of different modalities. I spent uh, 30 plus years as a psychotherapist, uh, hypnotherapist. I've done a number of different kinds of trainings, trauma specialist, etc. Uh, recovery from trauma. Uh, evolved from about 15 years ago to doing shamanic practice, uh, doing quite a bit of training and studying, etc., about shamanism. And so the soul healing to me, and there's probably different versions of it, I suspect, depending on who you talk to, but uh, soul healing really is a term that encompasses all of that. I think there's some spiritual psychotherapeutic techniques that uh, blend very, very nicely with the shamanism. Uh, shamanism being oh gosh, one of the oldest healing forms that's uh, been around on the planet for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, the shaman was the original go-to person, whether um, these days we have psychiatrists and medical doctors and medical specialists, but the shaman was uh, an herbologist and the shaman really was the one who uh, you would go to her or to him uh, to seek uh, um, some kind of healing and they would uh, first do uh, spiritual healing, heal at the level of spirit. And then anything else that might be needed would be uh, subscribed, such as a certain kind of herbs or plant medicine, etc. So soul healing um, really is that I think our, our, in our societies, uh, particularly Western societies, uh, there's been a lot of what you would call soul loss. And that is that there's, um, if you picture the soul as sort of a, a, an etheric, um, entity that animates us, that is our spirit really, that, that comes through as the soul, um, there's, there's a likely chance that over the years that you've been on the planet that there's been some fragmentation or soul loss. And often it is due to trauma. It's, um, it's a, as if, a, not as if, but really a piece of our soul that fragments off and goes to a place where uh, he or she or it stays safe until it can be recovered. Sometimes immediately, for instance, in a traumatic uh, experience. I had a traffic accident about a year and a half ago, and I, could, I felt, knowing what I know, I could feel this kind of dissociation. Oh. Uh, and that's a psychological term, but it's also, when we think of it as soul fragmentation, uh, that soul dissociates, uh, un unassociates, you know, leaves, moves yeah. away. It's as if a piece of me kind of left and said, whoa, wait a minute, what just happened? Mm -hmm. It was a fairly minor traffic accident, and I actually felt that piece come back in when things settled down. So it's but like some, it's a mini, it, it, the soul leaves the body. It's out of the body then, and, 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 and you're saying stay somewhere. Until, well, until, let's until put it this way. It's not, it, it's not the in. soul itself, because if the soul left your a, body, that'd be it. You're dead. A piece, a piece of the soul. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important to distinguish that, that it really is like an aspect or a piece or a fragment of the soul that leaves and um, sort of takes on its own uh, existence, if you will, into, into um, a place called non-ordinary reality. And the task really is to either somehow call that soul piece back, and there's a, actually a number of ways. There's a shamanic method that's very, very effective, but there's a number of ways. If we go into deep grief, for instance, and we say, I miss that part of me, you know, we start to call that part back. In shamanism, there's a particular type of um, healing called soul recovery or soul retrieval. 
and that's where the shaman or the shamanic practitioner uh, sends his consciousness or his soul into non-ordinary reality with the help of his spirit helpers to seek that soul piece and then bring it back and sort of install it in the person. It's very, very, very effective and, and it's completely compatible with um, psychologically what I've understood about trauma and the nature of post-traumatic, what's been called post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. So how, how, how can we know uh, how much we're complete? I mean, how, com how can we know how much of our Of our, the pieces of our soul are, are out there versus uh, really with us? Uh, that's a really good question, Lilu. Uh, the, uh, there are certain symptoms that would suggest, and I say suggest, uh, some kind of soul loss. Um, depression, lethargy, walking into a room feeling like something's missing, you're looking for something that, that you're not sure quite what it is, a feeling of sort of... Uh, alienation or, or a distancing from oneself. In other words, you, psychologically we might call that feeling dissociation. We feel a little dissociative, like we're not really in our body. Uh, those are some of the signs that suggest that there may be some soul loss. Now, it doesn't, it's not a hard and fast diagnosis because we're really, we're, we're really dealing with spiritual or the, root, the spiritual root of illnesses. And those are emotional, psychological, physical illnesses even. So that's, those are some ways that you can tell. Um, if you've had a really serious traumatic experience, then I would be suspect of soul loss. The key here, though, is that in, in terms of my work as a soul healer and shamanic practitioner, is that I'm going to consult with my guides, my spirit guides, because it really is spiritual healing. And I, I've learned over the years that we've developed this relationship uh, that I can trust them to take me to that soul piece that most needs to be returned. And I, there's never been an instance where I haven't found something or some piece of a person's soul to bring back and to install. Um, I think one of the keys here, Lilu, too, is that um, we're talking in metaphors when we speak of spiritual experiences. And I, more and more, I, I think of that term metaphor not as some literary device, but really as a way to speak about some of these spiritual matters. Now, are they true? Is it uh, provable? Not in the usual sense, because the term provable is more left brain, uh, scientific, you know, we got to do experiments to do this, versus um, having the experience of a soul retrieval and just feeling more whole and feeling better. Um, there's, there's a whole different reality when we speak of the soul's reality than the usual meaning of reality. So, and you are using also the, the, the animal, not the animal kingdom, but the spirit of animals to help you uh, to connect uh, with, with that greater yeah. self, uh, I mean, to help, I mean, how, how right. what is your relationship to the animal spirit? Sure, let's put um, the soul retrieval aside just for a moment and talk about spirit animals or animal spirit guides. A uh, book by the same name, Animal Spirit Guides. I've got one called Power Animals. These are um, animal spirit guides are any animal that shows up, any animal that shows up in the physical form or even in the symbolic form. Symbolic meaning we might um, uh, dream of an animal or we see a billboard or a poster of an animal. Uh, we, we, get a, we hear a sound that sounds like an animal. Those are, those are symbols, uh, looking in a book, for instance. So any animal that shows up, whether the physical animal or the, the, the symbol of the animal, in an unusual way or repeatedly, and I would say and or repeatedly, there's a really interesting thing that's going on here, again, at the soul level and in the soul's language. And what's going on is that spirit great spirit is trying to reach us through you could say the, the collective consciousness or the oversoul of a particular species and that a member of that species shows up for us in either physical or symbolic form for instance um, I was working in my office about three years ago finishing up a project a writing project one of my oracle cards I think it was messages from your animal spirit guides oracle cards And I'm goofing off. I'm playing backgammon on the computer or something like that. You know, I'm just goofing off when I should be working. You know, it was set aside for working. 
flying into my office, I just heard this flutter and off to the left I could sort of see it out of the corner of my eye and bingo, something hits the the uh, sliding glass door that's right in fr front of my office that I'm facing and looking out at the garden. It's a different office than where I'm at right now. And I went, oh my goodness, you know, I looked down there and there's, a, there's an adolescent hawk that flew into wow. my office. Now, I've, ri I've written about this on my web website, drstephenfarmer.com. There's a number of articles, and this one I think is called Jasper the Hawk or something like that. It's a whole involved story. But basically, I paused, I took a breath, and I thought, well, what's the meaning of this? I would qualify that as unusual, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I don't know many times <laughs> a or bird flies mean. into one's office or home, but that was definitely unusual. Yeah. Well, immediately what came to mind was focus on your work. Now, the, the, the idea is that I received a message from not just that hawk that was in the office that probably had a splitting headache by then because it pretty well slammed against the, the uh, sliding glass door, but I believe what was happening is just what I described is that it's as if uh, Grand Cent Hawk Grand Central said, okay, look, you know, farmer's not working. He's not working like he's supposed to. So let's send him a message through one of our couriers. <laughs> and so then Hawk gets the assignment to fly in. Again, mm. metaphor. You hear the yeah, metaphor? Yeah. It's a story. I don't know. There's no way to prove it's true. But it's a way to think about how these animal spirit guides work. And as a result, um, I got the message. I, I, and the other thing is that we, we learned is that it was chasing a dove. You know, I was looking for lunch, in other words, and there was this little dove I found a few minutes later tucked away just shaking because oh, wow. uh, the hawk had been chasing it. So then I got a second message was his dove is calm down, relax, and second is the hawk was chasing a goal, pursuing a goal. So I was reminded I'm pursuing a goal here. So keep on the goal, stay focused, and stay calm about it. So all those three things came through in that one experience. That's a good example of animal spirit guides. And they want to help us. It really wants to help us out. But those, but the spirit of the animals, are they, do they also have a, a, a mission or a reason for being here to help our soul evolve too and heal? Yeah, I think that's well stated. Is I, I really believe that um, there's a force that we could call spirit um, that is... Uh, wanting to work with us, the animals, I think the earth itself, you know, all the beings of the earth are really crying out for our help. And it's not just to help them, but it's to re-establish a different kind of, uh, or establish a different kind of relationship with the earth, one that's more intimate and respectful. Mm. It's pretty obvious, and it's pretty sometimes painfully obvious, you know, what's going on with our planet but it's not the planet. Earth is going to do just fine. It's that we have to revise our relationship. And I believe that these spirit guides, in whatever form they come, it could be angels, it could be ascended masters, it could be very, very well, I know, as ancestors, especially in our, our Western culture, we don't pay attention to our ancestors and the wisdom that they carry after they've gone into spirit world and they're able to connect with a larger force and to see things in a different way, you know, from their... Their, their place in spirit world. So uh, the ancestors and the animal spirit guides and the plant spirits are all reaching out to us in some way, shape, or form. As I said in my book, Earth Magic, it says the, the earth is speaking to us in all sorts of different ways. We just learn, need to learn how to listen, and I would add to that, respond. Mm, I love your quote that says, the world speaks to us, uh, we just need to learn how to become better listeners. Yeah, yeah, and listeners in all ways, you know, through all the senses that we have, the visual, and we got a ways to go with that. We've got, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years of habits that, you know, um, our ancestors, when they were informed, really have handed down to us as just a way of relating to the earth as something to be um, um, conquered and something for our use as human beings and disregarding the fact that... Um, pretty well known at this point that you know we're all interconnected and we're on this little rock in the middle of this universe you know we're not that big of a deal really when it comes down to it but as human beings we tend to think we are mm -hmm. so part of my mission with this and the teachings and the books and the radio show and the website and everything is to is to encourage and facilitate as much as I possibly can a deeper kind of soul healing which is to reconnect with spirit to, to really uh, uh, establish that as a as a 24/7 experience to be able to relate to the earth, 
not just some abstract God in the sky or or angels in the sky, but that we we need to also be able to incorporate the idea that God, whatever name you want to give that force, great spirit, all that is, uh, universal consciousness, I don't care what you call it, you know, it depends on who I'm talking to. I, I'll, as long as we understand it's more than the concept, it's, a very, it's very much a reality, and that reality exists as soon as you walk outside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My church is not a, a building. <laughs> My church is in the backyard, yeah. it's down at the beach, it's in the forest. That's where the, the real church is, I, I believe. Mm -mm -mm. And it's all around us at all time, and, but a lot of people now are craving this connection, I feel. Yeah, and uh, in my book Earth Magic, which it looks like you were reading from that, Lee Lewis, I tell the story of a tree healing, which, uh, like I say, this is a, another version of soul healing where a plant <laughs> actually helped heal my back. I, I won't even say helped heal, it really healed it. The short version of that is I was in a two-week process, shamanic training years ago, and uh, one, one of these times I went out, I'd spent about five days in a row sitting next to a tree communing with the tree and listening and taking in all sorts of information and teachings from tree spirit. And uh, my back, uh, one day I was so sore I could barely walk, it was just really tight. So I went out tree spirit and I did my usual prayers and offered tobacco to the tree as, a, as a, an exchange. And uh, I thought, what the heck, you know, I'm going to ask tree to heal me. So I sat there, put my back against the tree and I said, tree spirit, please heal my back, please. And I thought, what the heck, you know, give it a try here. I'm in a shamanic training anyway. Yeah. And um, I, I think I meditated like that for about uh, maybe five minutes at the most, not very long, maybe ten at the outside. And I got up and my back was still like tight. And I went, oh well, it was worth a shot. Um, about an hour later, about an hour and a half later, I went back to the class, sat down for, you know, the, the lecture, uh, that lasted about an hour, took a break, got up and stood up and I went, oh my God, my back is not sore anymore. Mm -hmm. Completely healed. I don't mean just better, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but completely healed. So are they, so, so, so you're saying that the tree has a soul and, and, and has a higher frequency or has a higher energy or is into, I mean, how, how is that, how was that possible? That's again, you're, you're a good interviewer. You have some really good questions. The tree, we could say the tree has a spirit, and a spirit meaning like a life force. Uh, you know, think about it. It's a miracle. I look at. I grew some tomato plants. You know, over the summer, it's a miracle. Yeah. I, I I left for a week and a half, came back, and I went, oh my god, there's tomatoes all over. I mean, we kind of go, oh, okay, big deal. It's tomatoes. It's a tomato. So it's, but if you stop and just consider it, it really is miraculous for something like this to happen. What I'm saying by that is there's a life force that, that wants to move out into, uh, into, into life, into the earth. And it could be through the form of a tree or a tomato plant. But we want to emerge into this uh, physical reality in some way. So there's some sort of a force that we can call spirit or a life force that we can call spirit that, that isn't. It's like I am life expressing itself as me, mm. not through me, yeah. not from me, but as me. You are life expressing itself as you. That tree is life expressing itself as that tree. The tomato plants are life, ex you, you get the point. Yeah. So, and back to your question, yes, that, that tree that I sat next to and that healed me, I appealed not just to the tree, the physical tree, which is pretty magnificent anyway, but in addition to that physical tree, the aspect of that physicality that is vibrating at that, you could say that denser level or that, that um, slower level of vibration, there's also a higher vibration that is an aspect of the tree that we could call its life force or spirit. So I'm, I'm reaching to that with my consciousness and making an appeal for a particular kind of a healing and the response was there. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying that would be always the case, but in this case it was one of those little miracles. So where do we, we need to, yeah, totally, 
totally a miracle. But how do we, how can we open up to, to that unseen energy, for example, to the tree? Did you have to raise your frequency or open your heart or, or how, what's, what's the different, I mean, steps if there is sure. such a thing? Sure. What, um, the difference, Lilu, is that, I, I don't know, different steps is so much, but that what, um, what is going on then is that as we move into a quieter state, a state of, you could say, a trance state, which, by the way, isn't a big deal. We go in and out of trance all the time. But the brain waves slow down. It's been uh, shown and proven, and more and more is being considered about something called a theta rhythm, which is a certain way that the brain has slowed down. Uh, we usually operate anywhere from you know, 14 cycles per second on up. You and I right now are in what you could call beta. It's an uh, active, alert, attentive state. Mm -hmm. And then when we get a little bit sleepy or quiet or we go into a mild trance, we would call that alpha. And that's usually the brainwaves slow down to about 7 to 14 cycles per second. And then as we move into a more relaxed state, they slow down to about 4 to 7 cycles per second. So it's a very slow. And what we believe, like Buddhist monks who meditate for years, they can go to theta like that. What we believe is that when we operate at that at that pace, or our brain operates at that pace, it really is a conduit to spirit world. So um, what I'm saying is going back to the example of the tree, when I sat there breathing, overlooking the magnificent Pacific Ocean from a cliff that was a thousand feet in the air, mm -hmm. just a beautiful, beautiful scenery, nature, the natural world, which is one way to access this, this state. Uh, we don't have to go down to four to seven cycles per second. We just get outside. Again, my church is outside. Um, but when we start to, to slow down and pay attention and listen in a different way, not listen with our agenda or our busy mind, but listen be underneath that and pay attention to what's going on, then we're much more available to spirits, promptings, teachings, and healings. However they may be. They could, through, could be through an animal spirit guide. could be through the kind of the more abstract idea of an angel. Um, angels are beings that have never been on this planet, so they can help us from beyond the planet, but they've never really lived in a human body. Whereas animal spirit guides have a physicality. Ancestors have, have had a physicality. I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. No, I'm no, it's, on fascinating. The question, it's but, absolutely fascinating. But it's that's the, ba the basic well. point. The basic point is that when we just slow down and pay attention and listen, not just with our ears, but our eyes and our senses particularly, mm -hmm. it makes it more likely that we'll um, be able to access spirit in all sorts of different forms and lead it more and more of a spirit-directed life, one that is um, appreciative and connected in an intimate way to all beings on the planet. And how does it communicate to us? Because it's a different kind of communication. Sure. We might ask a question and 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 then what? Like That's for example, we're in a forest. Uh, an example would be um, first off identifying. Uh, what's helpful is identifying for each individual to identify what are your primary um, uh, uh, sources of information in the world. So, for instance, some people are more visual some more auditory, myself, uh, some more kinesthetic, meaning physical sens sensations in the body, uh, emotions, but particularly sensations, and the fourth is cognitive, thought, you know, inspiration. So um, if you pay attention to how you take in just the usual information, like, uh, who is it, I was talking to a friend uh, yesterday, we sat and had a conversation, talked about an hour, and he was describing how he's more visual, uh, how his girlfriend who has some daughters is, he'll take them shopping and he'll, go, he'll be able to spot certain things that uh, he's able to pull off the rack and say, here, try this, try this, because he's more visual. So that's how he's going to access spiritual information more likely than, than these other modalities. Um, usually people are really good at, you know, primary, uh, uh, good at one primary modality and pretty good at a second, and then need to develop the third and the fourth. Myself, for instance, Lilu, is that I'm more auditory, so I hear. It's like a whisper in the ear. Uh, auditory and kinesthetic, or I get a sensation. Uh, when I'm doing readings, which I do intuitive readings, um, spirit animal readings, a lot of times I'll get sensations in my body that will then be interpreted by my mind. 
Uh, some people are more cognitive, scientists. You know, they'll get their scientist types and analytics will get their information more through thought and inspiration. So that's how the first thing is to identify. You said steps. Identify, you know, what way do you do this? Second thing is, um, as I said in a, in a broader sense of the word, listen, listen. Go out and listen to the trees. Get to know the trees. You know, pay attention, especially, and this is where, what's really cool about animal spirit guides. Pay attention to the animals that come your way, especially those that show up in an unusual way and, and or repeatedly. <coughs> Excuse me. Or through repetition. And then what you do is you, it, there are resources like my book, Animal Spirit Guides, which gives some suggestions about possible meanings. However, uh, and that's, that's a nice bridge, you know, to, to, to ultimately being able to go, uh, okay, this hawk flies into my office, I close my eyes, go, hawk, what message do you have for me? And then I pay attention. And for me, it's, again, primarily listening. Uh, I might get a feeling. I might, in my mind's eye, see an image. Or my, my, my vision might be drawn to something in the environment. As soon as I ask the question, what's the message? What's, and this is really key, Lilo, when as soon as I ask the question, then I pay attention to everything that happens. Right, but, but, but the, being present to that as being a message is key. Like yeah, you, oh yeah. You have to, be, to see it because a lot of, I guess a lot of people have those flash or hear things but just dismiss it, don't we? Oh, so true because we don't have a lot of support for that. We've tended to, to be um, uh, acculturated into believing that, that God is out there somewhere, that this is not an aspect or I'm not an aspect or an expression of God. And that word is so loaded for so many people. Um, I don't, again, I, I don't, somebody believes what they believe. I'm not um, interested in trying to convert people, but I do want to ask certain questions. It's like, well, maybe God or you could say great spirit or life force itself or all that is, whatever term you want to give to that, that is, uh, of course, we're a living expression of that force, of that power. Um, and people, I, I think we've just been trained, you know, for so long in uh, denying and separating, and that's the ultimate spiritual wound, is this illusion that we're somehow separate from spirit, mm -hmm. that we're separate from God. No, we're a beautiful, divine expression of God, just like everything on this planet. Even the kind of scarier stuff, hurricanes, earthquakes, that's all an expression of God. I've once said, God is in the light and God is in the dark. You know, get to know the dark. Take the light and put it into the dark. It's okay, but don't be afraid of it. The darkness in ourselves, you know, those shadowy elements that, that um, kind of interfere and inhibit us from our wholeness and from our uniqueness and from expressing our fullness into this planet, into this earth, and accomplishing what we need to accomplish while we're here. Mm. Tell us about that little, is that an angel that is on your wall back there? Yes, it is. I've got, I don't know if you can see, I've got two. Yeah, I can see. Yes. Let, me, let me just, uh, let me play with this a little bit. There's two paintings. Yeah. I can't draw this too far, but there's an angel, uh, uh, Mary, I think her name is Mary Lou, gifted this to me. It's a beautiful, beautiful rendering of an angel. I don't know that it's a specific angel. And then uh, what you're looking at there is a good a painting by my friend Jeremy Donovan from Australia. Beautiful. And uh, it's depicting the rainbow serpent, which is in the mythology or the stories, the creation stories uh, for uh, many of the Aboriginal people in Australia is uh, the rainbow serpent. The rainbow serpent crawled across the land and created the... Uh, the valleys and the hills and the water, etc. And uh, you know, different versions of it through uh, different uh, tribes and communities in Australia, but essentially that's the rainbow serpent. And the one right behind me is another Jeremy Donovan of uh, two intertwined snakes, rainbow serpents, and that's a representation of DNA, which is a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, that would be another interesting one that you talk about too. Um, and reprogramming of the DNA. I just love those. <laughs> those conversations as well but as you said maybe for another time however, yeah it's it's I it guess pretty intricate and complex but yeah it's fascinating again soul's reality what's the DNA I got a whole story that of, uh, about DNA but again I don't know how much time we have left it would do, take a couple you, you, you talk also about we can do that the DNA maybe another time because it's a vast sure. topic 
but you, I also read some things about uh, the the ancestral karma that we could heal, and it is important to heal. Can you tell us a little bit more? About yeah, I, I've actually uh, Lilu downloaded some information. It's come in different ways about um, what you could call ancestral karma. Uh, karma is sort of this yin yang balancing act that goes on. Some people who uh, look at it look at it as a past life balancing act. Some people misinterpret karma as punishment, which it's not. Uh, but what we do have from our ancestors, it's pretty. Um, it's a pretty simple idea, and that's that the um, uh, the the wounding that we carry and and the effects of that wounding that we carry. Excuse me, that was my fault. <laughs> the effects of the wounding that we carry, we can trace back through our ancestral lineage. And there's a process that uh, I. I don't want to take all the credit for this, but it's it's um, it's something that's evolved in uh, my own teaching and my own healing work. Is it's possible through this process to um, reach back across time to an ancestral spirit when you've identified, let's say, a certain um, problem or self-defeating behavior or even a physical illness. Um, I came across one story of a woman who uh, suddenly at about 35 years old developed this intense fear of drowning and she never had had that before and so she did some healing with an ancestor went back about I think it was two it might have been three but I think two or three generations back to a grandfather who died in the Titanic accident oh, wow. and so what she did is to work at a spiritual level to send healing love energy power to this ancestor um, to um, release that, that um, fear of drowning and then that healing came back to her and she's fine now. Mm -hmm. wow. That's an example. The, and the, 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 the cool thing about this, the, the thing that works about this too is that if I do this with a particular self-defeating behavior or a problem or an illness or an addiction and I, I can identify what that is in myself and then I can, uh, through this process, which I won't go into right now, but a process that uh, of calling in the ancestor that's also carrying that particular uh, wounding, that um, I can then heal that with the help of spirit and receive the benefits myself from that healing. And my offspring will then also benefit. And I've done some uh, healing work myself, ancestral healing, healing. That, we're, that's what we're calling the karma, how this kind of follows from ancestor to ancestor. And typically, we only have to work with maybe the uh, subsequent three generations, parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Because if um, 700 years ago, somebody carried something that's been handed down here, you can bet that it's in one of those ancestors there. So that's what we work with with this healing, this ancestral karma. How, how, do, you see those time, how do you see those timelines, though, between uh, the, the, the past, the present, the future, the different time uh, dimensions? Are you just jumping from... I mean, how, how, how does this look like to you? Uh, again, great questions, Leela. <laughs> uh, what, the way it looks like this is a way to think about it conceptually is that in this kind of work, in spirit work, for instance, we, I can do remote healing. I've done it. You know, I can send uh, healing power or energy, or I can do a soul retrieval remotely, or I can do some extraction, which means cleaning up, you know, stuff that doesn't belong there etherically. I've, I've done this quite a bit. I do phone consultations. I do uh, remote healing a fair amount of the time, I, in addition to face-to-face -face private consultations. So that's one sense is that space really is uh, a left brain phenomena. We think of space in a very linear way mm -hmm. and that's understandable, it's useful. You know, if I want to walk to the door and through the door, I have to have a sense of that space <laughs> and what it takes to walk through there. But if I want to, let's say, uh, Mary Jane in uh, Minnesota, you know, calls me up and we do a soul retrieval, what I do is I take myself there energetically to see what's going on, I do my work and then I retrieve the soul and I return it to her. I just did one of these yesterday, a private consultation, and it works. So with ancestors, similar kind of idea. In the spirit world, time is a whole different thing. In the spirit world, I can take myself back. 
I, you know, it's even a misnomer to say I take myself back because a different way to look at it is that exists right here and now. My ancestors are with me right now. My grandpa Mac is with me right now. I can, I can feel him. And he's a typical ancestor, my father's father. He's typically one of the ancestors I work with. And what I recall in terms of when he was alive was I was one of his favorites. You know, and he loves me, and now across time and space, he continues to love me. So same idea, if I want to do some ancestral uh, healing, ancestral karma with Grandpa Mac or any of my ancestors, I would call on them here and now from the spirit world, and they're right here. I've also contacted an ancestor, as the best of my uh, estimates, it's about 600 BC, a big Irish Celtic fellow oh, oh, oh. that uh, was the, uh, the tribal shaman, and uh, that's a whole other story, but uh, that isn't necessary to go that far back to do ancestral healing. We're really looking at the pre- Because you have oracle cards as well. How do you define oracle cards? What are they for? Yeah, the oracle cards... Um, Let's see if I have. Um, oracles have existed throughout time for us human beings. You know, looking at patterns in the sky, uh, the way the wind blows, uh, even tea leaves, uh, palm reading, uh, psychics. You know, we go to psychics to discover something or to find out a little bit more information about this or that or whatever. These kind of cards are, um, a lot of people say, oh, are they like tarot cards, which are, by the way, an oracle or a divination tool is another term for it. Um, these are a little bit different. Uh, there's actually in this deck, it's called Messages from Your Animal Spirit Guides, Oracle Cards. And it comes with a guidebook like this. So that you, when you, uh, let's say, we'll, if you want to do just a one-card reading here, yeah. uh, we'll pull a card and see what it says. If that's all right, Lila, sure, it's yeah. up to I you. I tried it on your site, too. Uh, I saw that you can do it on your site. Yeah, these cards are, you can get a free, uh, uh, gosh, cool. there's a free meditation, a free oracle card reading. I'm beginning, uh, uh, that uh, I think is really cool because you just punch the card with your, uh, that's your mouse. It turns over and it gives you a quick reading. These, uh, similar idea here with these, and also I've got uh, an iPhone app uh, from that. the original, You're from the first deck. It. Yeah. And then this one's going to be an iPhone app. My first deck is called Power Animal Oracle Cards. And, you know, again, it's, it's what the way these work, oracles work, is that there's, there, at some pre conscious level, we know certain things that were either yeah. just below our conscious awareness or we don't want to know or um, we're about to understand or we're about to bring forth this understanding um, but uh, it just isn't there so we we do something we go to a psychic you know we we listen for signs we talk to a, we get an animal spirit guy that comes in you know the crow that sits out on the arbutus tree here you know that showed up yesterday uh, eating some of the fruit from the arbutus tree and uh, the message there was a reminder about the magic. It was a reminder about being able to manifest what my dreams are. And that's, again, a whole other, it's related to some other work I've done. It's like, yeah, it's, you know, keep going, keep going. You're doing okay. Plus a need for nourishment, you know, to be able to nourish myself. So what, that's wait, another wait, way. Sorry, in what is your big dream? So, well, my big dream, um, there's certain things that are coming to fruition now, which is uh, a book uh, that I don't want to talk too much about yet because it's just an idea uh, and, and there's some work that's being done on it. Um, that's one aspect of the dream is to get this book out here, which I'm a healer and a teacher. I'm not a, I'm not a mystic. I go to mystical realms. I can do that, but that's it's kind of like mediumship. It's not my main gig. Yeah. You know, It's really about healing and the fundamental healing, the basic healing that we all are looking for, I think, is to heal that spiritual wound, which is the illusion of being separate from spirit. Uh, so that's one. What's been, uh, uh, the other has been happening because it's coming to me more than I'm seeking it is that we're also in the midst of preparing a children's uh, spirit animal oracle card deck uh, that'll be out somewhere in March or April. And then follow that is a series of children's books that relate to the spirit animals. So it's, it's also reaching children at an earlier age 
that hopefully the parents will, you know, parents that, that are open to this will um, help their children understand that there's a spiritual reality that we've, uh, with everything, <laughs> with the trees and the plants and the animals. So there's that showing up. Uh, there's some travel coming up. I'm doing a lot of, again, people can go to drstephenfarmer.com. There's my schedule. They can yeah, sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, website too. Congratulations. It's really nice. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I attribute a lot of that to Jessica, my assistant. She takes good care of the website. Okay. Here's the one that I drew. This is on your I behalf. See it it's camel. This is the video. A camel. Ooh, Let me show water. it up a little bit. You see it? Yeah. Okay. Camel says, through the cards, trust that you have the resources to get you through the challenges that are before you. Okay. Now, what, you, what will happen is if this hits a note for you, uh, great. It means that camel spirit can be helpful for you. Okay. So it's not just an oracle or a divination or a reading, but it's the possibility of calling on this spirit or any spirit guides to say, great. You know, you have, you, you may, in other words, what this suggested here is that you may have concerns or doubts, and we don't need to go into details about this, but about some of the challenges before you might have concerns and doubts, but Camel is coming through, the message is coming through spirit, through this. I'm glad he's coming through the car because otherwise in Chicago I don't see a camel very often walking around here. I don't think you do. I, you know, neither do, neither do we do here in Laguna Beach, Lee. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> but the, here's, the, here's the reality. You don't need to um, ever actually see the physical animal. You can call on the spirit. There's a few in here that uh, zebras, you know, I don't know. I don't see many zebras walking around the streets of Laguna <laughs> either. And then you can go, if you wish, you can go to the guidebook for a more extended reading, which I, I don't want to take the time to do here. But uh, let me just give you a, a, you know, a simple... Uh, blah, blah, blah. Trust that you have the resource to get through the challenge before you. Sometimes it feels like you're journeying across a vast, lifeless desert that stretches beyond the horizon with no end in sight. <laughs> etc etc it goes into the reading a little bit more and it's also very hopeful like you can you can like you can do this you can get through this and don't um, uh, whoever draws this card you or whoever draws this card it's like it expands your your possibilities like you go oh wait I guess I do have a number of resources um, and then the other thing is resources start showing up a friend calls and says oh Lilo I wanted to tell you about this and so and you go Phew. Thank you, <laughs> you know. Thank you, Spirit, uh, mm -hmm. for bringing this information to me. That's that's how the resources show up. Awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, uh, well, thank you so much for spending this time with us, Stephen. I enjoyed it. You're it a very was, good interviewer. Thank you, thank you. You're you're great to interview. That helps. <laughs> well, you had very good questions, and uh, you know, you get me talking. Sometimes it's hard for me to shut up. So. I appreciate <laughs> appreciate you indulging me and in kind of rambling here and there, but the focus again is to no, the focus you know, was just there on the more topic. and more of us, you know, need to just be reminded who we really are and what our connection is to not only this planet, but you know, the the universe, but especially this planet. Mm, mm, mm. So thank you. I honor what you're doing too. Thank you very much. And anytime you want to do this again, I'm real happy to.